Today we'll be taking a look at Generation 2 pseudo legendary Tyranitar in a solo run. Going into this one, I honestly expected something between the very wide gap of my ho -Oh run and the abysmal Iggly Buff run. I did do a live commentary version of Tyranitar late last year, and when we look at the stats, the same thing is going to stand out here. Being a pseudo legendary means you come equipped with a beefy 600 base stat total and an incredible 134 base attack, but the sore thumb that sticks out is this 61 speed but after doing that eagerly buff run with 15 base speed I think we're gonna be able to work around this as far as the moves go this thing learns pretty much everything it learns a ton of stuff including all three move tutor moves I have recently had some comments telling me that I should put the full move set on my overlay pretty much at all times and the long and the short of it is that it just takes up too much space now in my current setup I'd have to make these so small to fit that not even I I would be able to read it unless I had it full screened on a huge monitor. When you have a live updating overlay like I do, you need certain things to be the same and constant for each run so the allocated space for moves isn't that big and I really want things to be readable, but as a compromise for people who want the full move list, here it is on the screen. You can pause the video if you think you could maybe find some hidden gem of a move in there that I didn't use. Outside of that, I have made multiple improvements and altercations to my generation 2 overlay and I'll talk about those when they become relevant and before we begin I can't stress enough how important likes and comments are for helping small channels break into the algorithm and actually get some meaningful views so that I can compete with those big channels so if you want to help me out I'd really appreciate it now whether you're somebody new a returning subscriber like Meeves or maybe you're just someone who never comments or just doesn't know what to say just scroll down and let's top in Bruno's revenge because if you know you know and if we can get this video to 500 likes I will rush out an Iron Thorns video in Generation 1 for no other reason than it's a really cool Paradox Pokemon and it sounds like a lot of fun. And as always, the rules of the run are in the description if you want the rundown. And I'm playing on times 4 speed. The timer is going to start when I hit new game and I will not pause the timer until I beat red. But with that out of the way, I think it's time to sit back, relax, grab yourself a Sodi Pop, and take your bets now on how close Tyranitar can get to ho -Oh's amazing time. The first thing to talk about with this run is the starting moveset and I would describe it as unintuitive with 134 base attack as well as starting with not one but two moves that lower defense you would think that you would have a way to utilize that attack but today we'll only have bite. Bite is not a bad move by any stretch of the imagination but the key thing to remember here is that dark is a special type before generation 4's physical and special split and while Tyranitar does have a really good 95 base special attack it ultimately means that there's not much synergy with this starting move set and we'll be relying exclusively on this move in the early game the 30 percent chance to flinch is a nice bonus as well and with stab 90 effective power is actually really solid the last move is sandstorm and i'm not talking about darude because I would never make a 2014 meme reference. It's part of a trio of weather moves that was introduced in Generation 2, and while it doesn't raise or lower the power of moves of a certain type like Sunny Day or Rain Dance, it does do a constant stream of damage equal to one-eighth of the Pokemon's health, and it doesn't affect rock, ground, or steel Pokemon. It's interesting, but ultimately, I found its uses to be niche at best, and I'll mention it probably at least a couple of times in the video. Now as far as the rival goes, I went with Chikorita. Anytime you are playing a Pokemon weak to grass and you want the best challenge, you should go for that. It's mainly because there will be some early fights where Bayleaf has Razor Leaf and it's infinitely more challenging than Totodile. But overall, the rival is just not that big of a deal in Generation 2 and neither is this opening battle. For this run, I'm subverting expectations and the rival's name is three exclamation points rather than the usual question marks just so I can express how excited I am for you guys 
guys to get this video to 500 likes so we can both enjoy that Iron Thorns cross-generation run together. And guys, I don't know how many more excuses I can make for myself. I can't tell you how many times I left Professor M's lab without talking to him and ultimately it would lead to a full reset on the run. And in this footage, look at me walk all the way out of the lab and catch myself at the very last second before it was too late. Now for some reason, it's just so forgettable to me and I absolutely hate that the game doesn't automatically make you talk to him. What's up with that? Now let's get into some thoughts on the run. Overall, this is my third playthrough and more or less the optimized run considering that I'm not yet a master of Pokemon Crystal. Three runs is usually my hard limit on every video that I do and it's to keep the playing field even and honestly save myself a little bit of time because this is just a hobby for me. It's not a job and with Tyranitar, there's actually several early obstacles if you can believe that. Early on in planning, I entertained the idea of battling every trainer on the way to Violet City as well as knocking out any wild encounters, but it simply didn't provide enough experience. In this footage, I accidentally battled the very first optional trainer anyway, and this is kind of a mistake I make quite a bit today, unfortunately. I played Generation 1 a lot more, and in those runs, I do play at times 3 speed, so the jump up to times 4 speed is pretty significant, and since I'm playing on real time as well, I'm more prone to human error and mistakes. Now, I'm not going to call this out every time I make a little mistake, but there are a handful of them throughout the run, and just keep that in the back of your mind when we get to the end of the run. I'll also catch a bell sprout here for cut. Now, I'll talk about why it's the most efficient cut user later, but in my runs, I've started to catch HM dumpsters early, and my overall run time has improved as a result. Like I said earlier, Tyranitar does need some early levels, and unlike ho -Oh, I do have to dip into the optional sprout tower. It has easy battle it gives decent experience, and it bridges the gap to get to the breakpoints we need for what would otherwise be huge challenges. It doesn't take too long, and the game even gives you an escape rope at the end, and moving on from there, we can think about the gym. Now the whole point of these extra battles is to hit level 10, and as I go through Faulkner's goons, let's talk about the first bump in the road, and it's the fact that we are weak to ground moves. And if you didn't think Mud Slap was annoying enough, Faulkner has it on both of his Pokemon on, and he will prioritize it and with that said I think we can break down just how it goes here The lead is a lowly level 7 Pidgey, and like I just said, it's just itching to slap some mud on my face and lower my accuracy. But the key here is that level 10 guarantees the one shot, and it makes it obsolete, and just like that we're moving on. The Pidgeotto is a little more complex, it has some more variables. Now you're not going to one shot it, but you will do a sizable chunk. It will hit you with mud slap from there, and I just spam bite until the battle's over here. Now it's worth noting that if you got unlucky, you missed, and then you get hit with another mud slap and you keep missing you can just use sandstorm and that one eighth chip damage would get you by pretty much regardless of how much mud was on your face but that's the fight and that's the first badge down just like that mud slap is the prize here and with some of the hikers coming up you would think that you might want to use this move but there's two reasons not to the first is that it's a very weak move and the second is that bite being a special type just slices through those rock types anyway it makes it useless you're better off just saving that little bit of time by not having to go into the menu, finding the TM, and then learning it over another move, but ground moves not being that useful is going to be a theme, and we'll see that on a few occasions a day. Skipping past Union Cave, I'd like to give a shout out to my man Hiker Anthony here. He has a Machop, and I don't want to talk about fighting types just yet, and even though I generally route erratic spinners into my run, I didn't route Hiker Anthony, and my strategy was just to kind of pray that I could avoid him, and luckily, I do. Hiker Anthony, I think he could be a gym leader in my opinion. After cleaning up the slowpoke well, it's time for the next little challenge of the run as we start going through the second gym. Once again, very early in the run, we are faced with yet another weakness in the form of the bug type from the aptly named Bugsy. Here, hitting level 15 is key. You don't necessarily have to hit it in this battle, but remember I did accidentally battle a couple of trainers up to this point. But with that out of the way, let's see who will win. An unstoppable kaiju monster or a couple of little bugs.
While you are weak to Bug, absolutely no Pokemon in the entire game is weak to Metapod or Kakuna, and they are a very fast and very easy challenge. Now the way the damage ranges work here, it's honestly a coin flip if you can go toe to toe at the end of the fight, but here we will essentially see the one niche use of Sandstorm. I set it up early, and even though it uses two of its five turns before I make it to the end, I really only need it to hit once or twice to give me the advantage here. Scyther comes in, and it's going to start to ramp up that fury cutter damage now at first glance you might see that it only does seven damage and think that i have this one in the bag but don't start counting those chickens yet two bites and two sandstorm ticks would be enough to end this battle clean but i made a blunder i set up sandstorm too early and that means it subsides right before it would have done lethal damage this means scyther gets another crack at it and with the ramped up damage of fury cutter that seemed minuscule early it's now doing enough to slap us all the way down to seven HP, but it's still not enough and we survive, we take the battle, but we really don't have a lot of time to breathe. That's because there's an immediate rival battle and this is where giving him Chikorita can be a headache. Now as far as the Ghastly goes, Tyranitar completely bodies it with Bite and then we get to see that Bayleaf. Now like I said earlier, it having Razor Leaf is the reason that it's even on the team and after I do a little bit of damage, I immediately get crit and I go below half health. Now luckily, I still have the berry for insurance and I definitely needed it because this bay leaf is on X Games mode and it crits for a second consecutive time taking me all the way down to the red health before I finally take it out. I level up, I get a few HP from that, but at the end it's just our old friend Zubat here and even though I can't one shot it, I do get a flinch proc and that means I can safely finish off what was a real clincher of a battle. And you might be watching this and just be surprised by how many hurdles are present for Tyranitar early and it it was surprising to me too. A Pokemon that was this strong needing this much attention and care and number crunching early in the first 10 minutes was kind of shocking but when it's all said and done we did make it through unscathed with no resets and now we can kind of relax for a few minutes. In my previous crystal videos I have talked about Ilex Forest and I keep updating my thoughts on HM dumpsters as I get more experience and more information. I've already started to catch my cut user earlier but in this run I do want to Psyduck. In Pokemon Crystal, it has a 10% chance to spawn, but only at night. That's why we set our time there at the start of the game. Now, I do get lucky here. I find one really quick in the footage, but 10% encounter rate is kind of low. It's pretty inconsistent. And overall, I do think going ahead, the much faster route would be to have repels for the entirety of Alex Forest, avoid any wild encounters at all, and just go with the more consistent Krabby when you get to Olivine. It does the same thing. Now, I don't do that in this video and there is one niche use for having something like Psyduck that uses Surf earlier than Olivine but I'll mention that later. I just wanted to talk about HM dumpsters here because I keep updating my information from video to video and at this point waiting on things like Paris and Psyduck that have a low spawn rate while you just trudge through a ton of wild encounters hoping that you just see one is a major waste of time if you're using a rule set like mine. It's not efficient, it's not great. Now there's two more things to note here. Earlier in Azalea Town, I bought extra repels to account for this, and since I did Sprout Tower, I do have extra money, and that meant that I could go ahead and buy escape ropes there and avoid going into the Goldenrod department store later. It's huge, it takes a lot of time to get to them. Now the last thing I'll mention is why getting an early cut user is just overall better in every single way than doing something like waiting on a Paris, going to get Dig, and doing that. In general, I do think using escape ropes and the menuing required for that is just a little bit faster than using dig and I think dig in general is just kind of out of the way and it wastes a good bit of time to even go get and as far as Paris goes think of it this way if the clock is ticking you're trying to beat the game as fast as possible then why would you essentially waste your time just going through wild encounters for something that has an 85% chance of just straight up not appearing guys 85% is a pretty huge number and I don't enjoy talking about a HM Pokemon and Ilex Forest a lot, but I figured in this video I would just get it out of the way because I do think this information will be the most efficient going forward and if that's the case, then I just won't have to talk about them next time. But if something does change, I will mention it because I do try my best to be open to new strategies and information and I'm always learning guys and I just like to share the process with you. And as much as I would love just to quickly move on from Ilex Forest, I do have 
to mention Headbutt here. It's just a little base 70 power normal move. It's no body slam, but it does have a chance to flinch just like Bot. But more importantly, it's a move that finally utilizes our massive Kaiju attack stat. And it goes without saying that Headbutt is a pretty huge upgrade here. Now we can finally start to pick up the pace. In Goldenrod, I do the usual things like get a nice haircut for our handsome little boy. I grab the coin case, I borrow a bike, I pick up the Abra for those sweet teleport time saves. And moving forward, I'd like to give a shout out to my boy Juggler Erwin for trying to make it out here in life with his level 2 Voltorb. And here, let's talk about some alternate pathing from last video. I did briefly mention this in the Iggly Buff run, but you just go to the right here. You battle the bin on that trainer, you use cut and overall you save a decent amount of time over going to National Park. Now there are some caveats to this. Now the first would be if you were doing some run that just desperately needs Quick Claw, I don't know what that would be, or if you were going to use Dig. Now I've already stated that escape ropes are faster, more consistent, and just more reliable than getting an HM dumpster that can use Dig, but what if the main Pokemon you are solo running can learn it? Well friends, just like with Mud Slap, it's just simply not needed. Now I tested out multiple runs with dig and it's just kind of slow and it doesn't provide any significant advantages that would cancel out how far out of the way it is and the fact that it's a two turn move so i'm sure dig will be used in a run one day but it's not going to be in this video now we can look ahead to whitney i do battle the trainer right before her that's optional just because it's efficient and as far as the gym battle goes it's nothing special i do fall in love with the clefairy when it uses attract and then i set up sandstorm and from there we just have to remind Clefairy that we don't love them hoes and we move on to the meal tank. And I would say that overall I'm pretty decent with my top chart resistances and weaknesses, but some things still surprise me. Now I thought this battle was going to be a free win, but to my surprise, Rock doesn't resist Rock. That means Rollout can still start to do damage and ramp up, but fortunately I am at full health here and I got my Darude Sandstorm going on and I just kind of headbutt my way to victory. Rollout does start to do good damage after the third use but at that point it's too little too late now let's talk about some major improvements to the overlay shout out to scott for helping me with this but when you get a badge there's a top that corresponds with it now in this case whitney's plane badge is associated with the normal topping now in generation two on top of getting a badge boost that we are familiar with with every other badge there's also a top boost that isn't really mentioned in the game now in this case getting this specific badge will increase my normal moves damage that I use by 12.5% and I spent some time on the front end to reflect this up there in my effective power on the overlay. Notice how with headbutt a normal type move it went from 70 power up to 78 and that's due to the top boost from the plain badge. Every badge does have its own top and I'm not going to go over every single one because you guys get the gist and if you in general just like stats and numbers keep your eye up there for some really accurate move power from here on out. With that out of the way I head up to Ecritique and I immediately take on the Kimono Girls. Now I've actually kind of grown to hate these battles because most of if not every single one of them have sand attack and they are definitely not afraid to use it. It just stalls out battles and in general it's just annoying. Now I'm showing the Flareon part here because at the end of the fight I level up to 22 and that means we get access to a rock slide. With same type attack bonus it's an effective 112 power and with our attack stat it really makes us pack a huge punch when we need it and unlike generation one's rock slide we do get the third move in a roll that has a chance to flinch so that's just a pretty decent bonus on top keeping it moving we do have another rival fight in the burn tower and this is honestly about the time that the rival just stops being a challenge in most runs and it just becomes something to slap around and this is probably going to be the last time we see the rival in the video unless something interesting happens as for his haunter i do speed tie here now if it got the curse off it could could make this battle a little more tough, but it doesn't, and Bot does its job. Now next up is the threatening Bailey from earlier. Here I outspeed, I hit it with a rock slide for massive damage, and from there it hits back with a non-crit razor leaf. Now here, I set up Sandstorm, and I can only deduce that this was a fat finger because it does not benefit me at all. In fact, it's actually kind of a huge hazard to let this thing use another move, but here it just misses, and I take it out. Now we see Magnemite, and Steel Top's back in the day where grow 
grossly overpowered. They had additional resistances like dark, meaning that everything I have is not very effective. And you might be thinking, hey Matt, this is where dig is good, but I can just two shot it. So where exactly am I saving time with a two turn move? And ultimately it comes down to Zubat and let's just give the rival a round of applause because he gave us one tough battle early and that was pretty much his purpose of today's video. That opens up Morty and Tyranitar is the very definition of a hard wall in this fight. Bite just by itself can demolish everything outside of the Gengar because I do think it would be better to use Rock Slide there but I don't. I waste some turns but it really doesn't matter. This one overall is just a freebie. And now friends I'm heading east to Mahogany and the reason is hidden power. Tyranitar is a prime example of a Pokemon just being elevated to new heights with the coverage that this move can provide. Hidden power is a defining move of generation 2. It has the ability to be a 70 power base move of any type since I do edit DVs for this run. The type you get is going to be based off of your attack and defense DV and for this run flying will be our hidden power type. Unfortunately, Hidden Power Flying does have the drawback of requiring you to lower your attack DV down to 12 and your defense DV down to 13. I know it's hard sometimes for you guys to probably visualize what these numbers mean and all the things that I'm saying, but if you want to know the minuscule difference between a level 30 Tyranitar with a DV of 15 in attack or one with 12 in attack, it's only two points. That's right, you're going to miss out on a whole two points of attack in the mid game and that's it. Personally, I use Purple DVs for all of my generation 1 runs and using 12 attack at first just felt bad but after crunching some numbers it did put my mind at ease a little. Let's use the red fight at the very end of the game as an example. The difference between 15 attack and 12 in attack in that specific scenario when you are in your mid 60s is only 5 attack which considering we'll be at roughly 260 attack at that stage means that there's less than a 2% difference in power so what I'm trying to say is that in 99% of all situations using the correct hidden power type is always going to be worth it because a few points in your attack stat is so minuscule and negligible that if that alone is swaying your battles then it's pretty much possible that you just routed wrong. Outside of that I will say that I really enjoy hidden power. Now it provides this wrinkle and depth to the overall strategy of these generation 2 runs and the challenges I faced for this video really kind of renewed my excitement to do stuff like this. Now I start off these runs by testing it out with perfect DVs. From there I just kind of find the parts of the run that I'm going to be struggling at and then we start to look at hidden power afterwards. Then I'll crunch the numbers because in cases like Igglybuff it just simply didn't matter what you chose for hidden power. It's not going to help you get past your problems. The last thing to mention here is the one benefit of having an earlier surf dumpster provides. It doesn't necessarily have to be Psyduck. It could be Poliwag but getting access to surf and Gyarados while you are here, it can save you a little time. The ability to take on Gyarados now allows you to talk to Lance and it eliminates the need for you to come back to the Lake of Rage later. But if you are doing a worse run, it also opens the possibility of doing the rocket hideout earlier than you normally would do it, which would be a boon to something that's really struggling at this point. Now, if you don't need to do the rocket hideout now, you can just fly to the Lake of Rage directly. So it's really not that significant, but I thought I would mention it. It's just some thoughts in my head. There's also the TM for Detect here. This might be the only time we ever see Detect. It doesn't really have a use for a long time, but it's actually going to be a pivotal move for the run, but we'll get to that much later in the video. It's also worth noting that Abra and Teleport is what allow this whole little journey to be possible without wasting too much time. If you heal an Ecritic and avoid healing throughout this whole process of going to the Lake of Rage, you can simply use Teleport, go back here, and eliminate any backtracking, which is key to keeping up the momentum of the run. From there, it's straight to Olivine. I complete the Lighthouse segment and now we have more overlay and front end improvements to go over. In Generation 2, the day of the week is going to determine when you can get lots of items and in my other runs, I would simply pause the game and change the day to do this. Now this was a bit archaic, it didn't feel good and another improvement I made to the game was it automatically changing the day depending on my location. Now for example here in Olivine, I want the day to be set to Monday and that gives me access to Monica right outside of the city and she gives me sharp beak. Now this is a top boosting move and if it wasn't obvious it increases the damage of flying moves by 10% and top boosting moves will be
be pretty crucial for this run in general in key battles. Now, my friends, I would like to read you Tyranitar's Gold Pokedex Entry. Ahem. <laughs> Its body cannot be harmed by any sort of attack, so it is very eager to make challenges against enemies. Now let's just bring up this top chart, and you might notice, if you squint your eyes, you might notice that double weakness to fighting. So in conclusion, So that was a f lie. And before we take on Chuck, I have one more overlay improvement to point out. I'm going to learn Hidden Power here, and it's a 70 base power flying move at this point, and we've already talked about that. Except here, it's going to get that 12.5% increase to damage due to us having Faulkner's Flying Type Badge. We've talked about that earlier. The next thing I'm going to have displayed for you guys is held items. Now if we take that 70 base power, we add the 12.5% increase from the corresponding badge, and then I equip the sharp beak, you're going to see an extra 10% increase to the move on the overlay, which is going to give hidden power flying an overall 86 effective power. This is honestly very cool to finally get working, and once again, thanks Scott for the help. That guy who always says I mentioned Scott too much, you can comment now. As for the lead up to Chuck, I can pretty much just one shot everything, so there's no need to go over it, but now now, I think it's time to settle down and get ready for some Chuck, brother. He leads with Primate and I outspeed. The key thing the Sharp Beak did for us here is it makes this a guaranteed one shot and just like that, we are halfway through the battle. Now it's onto the Polyrath and we don't one shot here. Now this opens us up to a dynamic punch and my recent experiences with Gen 2 leads me to believe that Chuck will never miss the first dynamic punch and we get our very first look at how weak Tyranitar can be to fighting damage. Now here, it 100 to zeros us and now you guys kind of understand why so much of this run's planning kind of revolved around alleviating its fighting weakness while trying not to lose any time overall. Now on the next attempt, you're about to see why Tyranitar is a beast. I get hit with Dynamic Punch because why wouldn't it hit for a second time in a row with 50% accuracy, but Tyranitar survives at just 1 HP, but at the end I do get confused. This means from here, I got one shot, but if Chuck can hit two Dynamic Punches in a row, then I can beat one Confusion proc and that's what happens, and I take this fight, and now we can actually breathe a sigh of relief. With this routing, the Chuck fight was very consistent in practice. In fact, I think it's really unlucky that we had our first reset here because Dynamic Punch is not a guaranteed one-shot. I had about a 63% chance to survive, meaning that the fact that he hit a 50% accurate move and then hit a 37% chance to one-shot us is just proof that sometimes the AI is just going to win if it wants to, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. But I am glad that this is over, and things are about to be more relaxed for a little bit. Now that we have Fly, I can backtrack for a few things like the Rare Candy in Violet City and the one south of Goldenrod, and to the west of Violet City, I picked up another held item. On Thursdays, Arthur here will give you the hard stone and that'll give us a boost to our rock type moves and it'll be pretty helpful going forward. I also use this time to pick up the TM for return and I also buy the TM for fire punch. Now don't get me started on why Tyranitar can't learn the other elemental punches and he only learns fire, but it is pretty helpful. I learn both of these moves immediately and if you're wondering about return, at this stage in the game, it's already began to out damage headbutt, making headbutt obsolete Elite, and the gap is only going to widen from here. Now it's time for everyone's favorite tedious and long-winded part of the game. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Rocket Hideout. It's here, and we're immediately going to skip over it, and we're going to go straight to price. Now I've transitioned over to the Hardstone. I put it on just like a chain around my neck, and as far as the fight goes, I just use Rock Slide. With the Hardstone, it is at 123 effective power, and even though it's only super effective on the Dugong, it really doesn't matter. I can blast through this one, and once we are done, I can go back to Olivine, and now we can just take on Jasmine immediately. This is the one part of the run that Fire Punch comes in clutch. I did hold off until after the hideout and price because those extra levels really help here. I can already just one shot the Magnemites, but the Steelix is out of that one shot range. Now the Charcoal could help your ranges a little bit, but it's very unlikely that you'll lose this one in general. Now I think I tested this one about 15 times, and I only lost one time, and that's because Iron Tail crit, but here we take it down pretty 
pretty easy. Our reward is that we get to go do more rocket related shenanigans and I'm not going to put you guys through that so with the power of video editing we're jumping straight over it. When all that malarkey is said and done I do pick up the pink bow. Now you can also get this on Tuesdays on the first route of the game but there was no need for Tyranitar to rush it and we'll just take it from Mary here. This will give normal type moves return specifically a 10% damage boost and we've reached the point in the game where it's really pretty much going to start taking over as our default damaging move. Now also how cute does Tyranitar look with this bow on? Now it's not only practical and useful but how stylish is it? You really can't get much better than this. Before I leave Goldenrod I do something that I neglected to do in the ho -Oh run. I go back to the mart and I pick up a lot of vitamins with all of our money. I'm actually able to afford five proteins and four carbos and these really help to round out my stats as we go into that late game. Now let's take it all the way to clear for the final badge and this one is going to be anticlimactic. Even without ice damage it doesn't matter. I can one shot all of the Dragonairs with one return and it's worth noting that with the Hardstone, Rock Slide does do just a little bit more damage than return overall but since it has less accuracy and less PP I don't think it's worth it anymore at this point. I guess you can say that Kingdra can survive a hit and it does a decent amount of super effective damage back to us but that's pretty much the whole battle and just like that we're pretty much ready to start looking at the Elite Four. On our way there let's talk about the process of optimizing this run and I'm gonna go ahead and discuss Bruno now so that I don't have to stretch my footage out two miles when we get there. Now next to this Bulbasaur family trainer there is a house and it contains the Sandstorm TM. Originally I was utilizing a strategy with it and it didn't require me to battle anything extra and that tiny little 1 8 sandstorm damage was actually enough to make Bruno's Machamp manageable and we'll come back to that thought in a second. On the final run here I am going to pick up two extra battles. There's cool trainer Brian. He has a sand slash. It's whatever. Uh, it likes to use sand attack but death is inevitable and outside of that I do battle Gavin. He's just past the healing house close to Victory Road. He has evolved Pokemon. He has a very easy battle. All of them are very quick and it's over 4,000 experience for a short amount of time. So let's go back to the Bruno Tonk. I said I was picking up Sandstorm and it did help smooth out the damage ranges but the problem that arose from that was the learn set. We only have four moves. We need return. Hidden power flying was a must and Rock Slide is just too helpful in some tough battles for the rest of the game and we have Fire Punch. I'm about to learn Crunch and you might think that's the obvious choice but Crunch and its special damage actually provide a lot of uses coming up now and throughout all of Kanto and I was having problems on the Onyx with only resisted physical damage and it just didn't feel that great it wasn't that consistent so the solution is what I just showed I pick up two strategic extra battles and that gives me enough extra experience to hit another level later and we'll pick back up on that when we progress to the Elite Four now I guess I should mention Earthquake here I simply just don't get it I did in all of my practice runs and when I started to refine and trim down the fat just like with Mud Slap and Dig early on, I found that it wasn't needed and it really didn't speed anything up at the end of the day. Now I'm definitely not picking up a single move for like one Elite Four Pokemon and Lieutenant Surge. And outside of that, there is one more rival battle, but brother, you've already had your time to shine in the video and I'm going to cut you off and let's just jump straight into the Elite Four. Wheel is first, and in the previous rival battle, I hit level 47, and I got Crunch. And that's pretty much it. That's all you need to know. He has all psychic Pokemon, and Crunch will one-shot each and every one of them. Now, even without Crunch, Return could pretty much do the same thing by itself. We could just move on. Now, for Koga, this fight went from very trivial with Fire Punch on previous runs to a mild speed bump with an earlier level up and having Crunch. Now, Ferretris is an absolute tank. It has about 42 resistances and not having fire damage means that it goes from taking one turn to taking three which really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things without earthquake muck does take an additional turn but i crit so it's kind of just irrelevant and at the end there's venomoth and crobat and both of them are just going to get crushed by a rock slide and now we can look ahead and now my friends here's the huge optimization of the run first things first i strap my beak back on in those earlier battles allowed me to hit level 48 on Koga.
Koga. This means that here I can use two rare candies, I can hit the damage rounding threshold at level 50, and I can be very comfortable in the fight without sacrificing a move slot, and let's just see how it plays out. Sometimes I feel bad about these optimized runs. The fact that this specific battle was pretty much what the whole game was centered around and it took multiple runs to solve this problem is something that we really don't see. I can talk about it, but at the end of the day when we get into the battle, literally everything is just going to be a one shot and it looks pathetically easy when the reality is that lots of planning went into this. Now for the first few Pokemon, the only thing to note is that Mach Punch on Hitmonchan is a priority move. Move. It's very annoying and it does a pretty nice little chunk of damage and there's really nothing you can do about it. As for the Onyx, Earthquake does hurt and if you don't have Crunch and it's one shot potential, this one can become a hassle so that's another reason I went the route that I did. Finally is Machamp. Level 50 with the Sharp Beak is a guaranteed one shot and I want you guys to actually know how much damage a Cross Chop does. At level 48, it would do about 200 average damage on a non-crit which is always a one shot with that mock punch chip damage from earlier but if Bruno crits guys if he crits it can have a max damage roll of 468 which is honestly kind of bonkers and I just want you guys to remember the Pokedex entry guys its body cannot be harmed by any sort of attack but that's pretty much the fight it looked easy but Bruno was the hardest battle of this run now we're on to Karen and this fight can be annoying now this is like the Agatha slash rival 2 fight of this generation but the thing about all of my practice runs is that even if I got sand attacked confused paralyzed and cursed all in the same battle I usually still just won anyway here I actually avoid most of the annoying stuff and I start really strong with a crit to take out the Umbreon instantly and I get through fairly quick and once you progress deeper rock slide starts to become very potent at the end I go for return on the Houndoom but it fails to knock it out and we get to see an annoying roar strategy our poor level 5 5 Abra gets pulled out and sacrificed but the idea here is that I would use return and I would just save some rock slide PP for Lance so that I could avoid using an elixir and maybe save a little time but it didn't work out but that's basically the fight and finally we get to Lance and for the 10th time we are making a held item change in the run the hard stone is key here and the one fact about Lance that you need to know is that even though he calls himself a dragon master all of his Pokemon are flying tops and today this stab Rock Slide is about to feast. In every part of this battle, I'm going to have a 247 effective power nuke. And even without the Hardstone, it would still be a one shot on five of his six Pokemon. I also outspeed everywhere that I need to, so outside of that 90% accuracy and that 10% chance to miss, it's pretty safe. Hardstone does add some insurance by putting that level 50 Dragonite at the end into a guaranteed one shot range. And the only thing to note about the fight is that Aerodactyl does outspeed us. Now I guess theoretically it could land a bunch of rock slides, permanently flinch us, and eventually win, but it just really doesn't do enough damage. And just like Claire was for the final badge of Johto, this champion fight is pretty anticlimactic. And just like that, Tyranitar has dominated Johto, and it single-handedly became the champion. Now we are at less than an hour of in-game time, which is a faster pace than Ho-Oh, and that's pretty exciting, but guys, it's not over yet. We still gotta go through the Kanto region. From here, Tyranitar is going to put on its pink bow and it's going to put on a clinic. By now, you guys know how Kanto is going to go. I'm going to crush everything and we'll be doing the Cliff Notes version of what's important as we progress to the final fight. The first thing I'll talk about is Surge pisses me off. Now, Return can easily handle everything. It's a one shot outside of the Magneton. Now, the problem here is that his team is really fast and three of them know double team and he's just going to use it. Now, it's just a very annoying strategy. You already know that, but he should honestly feel bad about trying to waste my time. Next up in Celadon, I'm going for a groundbreaking new strategy today. I'm picking up a little hidden gem of a TM in Curse, and maybe you've heard of it. You might be thinking, Matt, why are you so brave for trying such new and innovative strategies? And I know, if you were curious, I was itching to record Gen 2 when I got my overlay finalized, and this run was recorded sometime in the time frame between the Iggly Buff video when I made it, when it was recorded, but before 
before I released it, so we'll have a little compromise between the things I talked about in that video later, but if you are someone that loves the end game coming down to curse and rest, get ready to be on the edge of your seat. Outside of that, I do pick up leftovers, and I'll actually talk about Erica this run. Hidden Power Flying actually provides some time saves here. Things like her Blossom are actually tanky enough to survive her return, and would normally take an extra turn to take out, and I'm glad Erica actually made her way into a video for once. Something I always found funny was this lowly Rocket grunt in Kanto. Team Rocket was already on the brink of disbanding because Giovanni had been gone for years, and considering that at this point we've already wiped out the rest of the higher up members earlier, this dude is pretty much operating on his own with a single level 30 Golbat. I should give him Juggler Irwin's number, and maybe they can throw around that level 2 Voltorb together. Before Blue, I will add an addendum to this trainer before Brock. Now I thought for lots of runs that this little kid was an erratic spinner, and I battled him nearly every single run, but it turns out that the grass just makes it hard to tell, and he's just a normal spinner, meaning that if you can just be a little patient, you can skip him, and it does save me a battle, because I just generally battle all erratic spinners to make the routing process consistent. Now it's time for blue, and since this isn't the Iggly buff run, I'm not going to be resorting to curse strats on this fight. Now honestly, it would probably just be faster, but I do have a little dignity left, and I'm not going to do that today. I'll give you guys a time at the end of this fight, and we'll talk about the reasoning in case you didn't watch that Iggly buff video, but let's just dive into it. First up is Pidgeot. There's not much to say here. We got Rock Slide. We can move on. Then Rhydon comes in. Now this is the worst Pokemon to face on his team, but we did keep Crunch for heavy damage, and this is a situation where it helps. I'm not too familiar with Gen 2 AI, but I don't think that Blue has good AI because here he doesn't use Earthquake and he just misses Fury Attack. From there, he does something that you really don't see often in Gen 2. He makes a swap, he pivots to the Gyarados, and this is fine because we do have Rock Slide and the fact that it just ate a free crunch means that it's even more free. From there, he brings back then the injured Rhydon and it's almost a clean sweep. I take it out, then the Executor can fall to a crunch and crunch is also good enough for the Alakazam. Now the thing about Alakazam is that it does get a Reflect up before it goes down and unlike Gen 1, Reflect will work for his other Pokemon. This means that the Arcanine can actually survive a Rock Slide and Blue decides that he's going to use his one and only turn using Roar and he's going to drag out our poor and defenseless little Psyduck. He does use that time to use a full restore and guys, look at Psyduck's waterfall damage. Honestly, I'm going to say that Psyduck was the MVP of this run for that. Ultimately, all this does is prolong the fight and since Reflect wore off, Rock Slide does take us home and we get that final Kanto badge. And Blue is down. Now last week, I said I would entertain the idea of officially ending the run after Blue and while I'm not officially doing this, it's worth noting that the frame that Leader Blue was defeated would give us a time of 1 hour, 13 minutes, and 53 seconds in case I'm going to look at that in the future. Now if you are new or haven't followed my crystal runs, I simply think that the meta pushes you to the best strategy and it's often going to come down to curse with rest with return so that you can beat red even if you are significantly out leveled. Banning these TMs is an interesting idea, but when you think about how much extra battles red would take, then it would become a nightmare, especially if you're in the slow leveling group, but we'll kind of explore that for later runs. All you need to know for now is that I time blue just in case we make some changes in the future. And guys, I make a huge mistake here with the original footage. Something went wrong at the end, and the red footage was kind of just ruined. I have my final time recorded, I remember the battle, and I went back into my save file, and I was able to record more footage so we can actually talk about it, but I don't know what happened, but at least we can talk about the strategies, and we can actually see some footage with that in action. I'm disappointed, but I'm going to be positive about it. Now, first things first is that I have six rare candies left after we used a couple on Bruno, and that gets us to level 66. It's not great, but it is what it is. We just have to make do. Next up is the usual strategy. I'm learning curse. I'm learning rest. We've seen how it works, but today we will be using detect. This move will protect Tyranitar from all effects that target it when we use the move of course including damage and it will always go first or it's increased priority. Using it consecutively will half its success rate each time meaning that you just can't spam it. It's a pretty niche move but today we found its niche. Now I've alluded to curse rest return strats with a fourth supportive move last time with the Iggly buff run and here it is in action and I think we can just take a look at red.
Pikachu is first, and we do not outspeed. Charm will lower your attack two stages, and it's annoying. But it's not the end of the world, guys. Now, I went back and forth on this one, but generally, you want to set up at least one or two curses. I think that's the safest, especially when you look ahead at the later parts of the fight. Now, here in the new footage I recorded, it just goes for thunder a ton, and eventually, I take the risk of just going for rest to see if I can be at a little bit higher health than what I would be normally, and when I'm resting, I get hit with a critical thunder. So, it's not looking too great but Pikachu does miss its last thunder. I wake up, I knock it out, I'm at 77 health, and now we're looking at Venusaur. And this is a very interesting fight. You are slower, and the AI wants to go for Solar Beam, but it does have to charge up first. This means we're in a unique situation where you know the damage is coming, and you can use Detect to avoid that damage. The loop here becomes you using Curse, and then you start to use Detect to avoid Solar Beam damage. Now, I find that plus four works the best, but another key thing you need to know here is that you need to be at decent health to trick the Blastoise AI that's coming up. Now another tricky part about this fight is that the Venusaur can start to use Sunny Day if your health gets a little bit too high, meaning that Solar Beam will no longer have a charge, and overall this is one of the more unique situations I've ever been in in Pokemon, but since we did practice a lot, we get set up, we get enough health back, we knock it out. Next up is Blastoise, and I'm going to keep this one brief. Basically, the AI will only go for Surf if it knows it can knock you out. Recovering enough health via leftovers earlier almost ensures that it's going to go for Rain Dance and that means we get a free return off and we can one shot it with the plus 5 boost because guys, we have 901 attack. Now I think the worst part is over, but Espeon is an annoying little kitty. Now for some reason it has Mud Slap. Why does it have Mud Slap? It's super effective, that means it's going to use it and you guys better get ready to have your accuracy lowered and if you miss just once, you're going to get more Mud Slaps and even a Reflect can just really slow you down to a crawl. Now luckily, I just hit return after one accuracy drop. Next is Snorlax, and there's no amount of bulk that's going to stop you from getting demolished by 900 attack, and I connect once again. Last up is Charizard. Now Tyranitar just decides that it's going to make the perfect sweep and go ahead and ignore the accuracy drop once again, and after some pathetic damage, a return knocks the lizard out of the sky, and we take the run. Now I know this is extra footage, but now that we are done, let me talk about the stats that actually happened. I was at 1 hour and 16 minutes when I made it to red, and simply put, I got really unlucky here. One time the Pikachu used Charm, and it made it kind of hard to set up, and that one led to a real drawn out battle where ultimately I got crit and I had to reset. I also had an additional reset when I fat fingered my moves, Venusaur was in a range where it could go for Sunny Day, and instead of just going for Return, I accidentally hit Curse again, and sure enough, it set up Sunny Day, and eventually the boosted Solar Beams coming out instantly was just too much to overcome. So at the end of the day, Tyranitar finishes the run at 1 hour, 19 minutes, and 53 seconds, which is about a minute or two faster than Ho-Oh, and that's pretty surprising to me, but guys, we're not done just yet. Now what if you didn't use rest and didn't use return and still time the run at red? What would the consistent fight look like then? I think we should explore that real quick. Here our learn set would be return, thunderbolt from the move tutor, hidden power flying, and rock slide while holding leftovers. This is an all damage set, and I wonder if you could get rid of return or rock slide in favor of rest or maybe some other supportive move but we're just going to go with this today now the key here is that we're level 76 that puts us past pikachu's speed we can avoid charms now it's worth noting you could have used more carboses earlier in the run if you knew we we're gonna have to get to this level and you could maybe hit that 171 speed threshold a, a level or two earlier i don't know outside of that let's hop into the battle and we'll see how it goes now like we just said pikachu is outsped and we simply one shot it Venusaur is also perfectly consistent. It'll use Sunny Day or charge up a Solar Beam, but you outspeed it, you're gonna go first, and Hidden Power Flying does like 80% of its health, so it's a pretty much a free two-shot. As for the Blastoise, I originally thought Tyranitar learned Thunder, and I made this graphic here for Rain Dance, and I was gonna go on this big spiel about it, but it doesn't learn Thunder, but I'm gonna put Rain Dance up on the screen anyway. Here, it seems that since Venusaur used Sunny Day, and the game knows there's an active weather effect, it's just gonna go for Surf. Now, since Sunny Day halves the effectiveness of water moves, it just kind of tickles. Now, it's the same as Venusaur here. You outspeed it, you're going to get off the first Thunderbolt, it's going to use its move, and the second Thunderbolt will comfortably two-shot it, and we can move on again. Now, what's funny about doing the fight this way is that it's kind of the polar opposite of the Curse strategy. Curse is not consistent at the start, but once you do get set up, it becomes a series of one-shot. And here, trading off that power means that you're still going to underspeed the Espeon, and it's going to put you in a luck-based position. 
Here, I get hit with mud slap, I miss my moves, and I get hit with a ton of more mud slaps before I finally progress. Now what that means is that this fight becomes awful. It's such a slog, and you can see from this footage that I just miss a million times. And when I finally run out of return PP, I'm just, I'm not gonna deplete my PP trying to hit the Snorlax. I just concede the battle. And from there, I level up two more times, and we're gonna try this again at level 78. This time on the Espeon, I only take a single mud slap. I go for the more accurate return, and that means that my accuracy is not gonna be debuffed nine times. Red does set up Reflect, which is annoying, but only having one stage lowered on my accuracy is pretty good. Let's look at Snorlax. Since Reflect is up, I'm gonna fish for Paralysis procs with Thunderbolts until it wears off. I don't get it, but eventually it does wear off, and I start going for returns, and we get past it. Now Charizard is last. We do have Rock Slide, but since my accuracy is lowered, I do go for the safer return. It takes uh, one turn longer, but who cares? And that's basically the fight. And that's the end of the run. I think doing a full-timed red run with Curse Band would probably add like 20 or 30 minutes to each run, especially if you're playing a slow leveling group Pokemon like Tyranitar. Now for now, I'm just gonna time blue like I did in this video, and I'm just gonna keep waiting for some feedback. Now Curse is easily the best strat, and banning it means that you're likely gonna have to waste a lot more time grinding just to get the same results, but who knows. Now there are two more rare candies. This is worth noting, this is out of nowhere. There are two rare candies that I never get, and the next time we do a crystal run, I'm gonna look into that, refine a little bit more, get a little better, but that's about all I have for you guys. Now, special thanks to my channel members for their support. I really do appreciate it, and if you made it this far in the video and you're not subscribed, what are you doing? Just hit the subscribe button, please. And overall, this was a long one. I'm kind of gonna, I'm really worried that it's a bit too long-winded, but I really enjoyed playing this one, and I enjoyed editing it. I put a little more time into it. It's fine. It's gonna be a long video. I'm okay with that. I can live with that. And with that said, I guess I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye.